The scripture reading is from Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal them on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks to God. On behalf of Mama and myself, I want to thank you again for the way you encourage and love our son and uh, work with him to strengthen the work of Christ through this church. We are in love with you for doing that and thank you so much for your kindness. The anthem was especially significant to me today, Sally, because when I come back here, I think of myself as coming home. It's been 69 years since I knelt right down there and gave my heart to Christ for the ministry. And um, I realized that I've probably lived half of my life already, so I you know, don't have too many more years to go, but uh, <laughs> it's always good to be here and to come home to uh, this wonderful church. Now, the scripture which was read for you today very well by Paula, there's six brief verses, and it's, it's a little story. It's a drama. It's about a man in a synagogue. Jesus is there. The Pharisees are there. And there's a confrontation. And... Uh, some terrible things are taking place in this brief little drama. Now you have Pharisees who have come not to worship God, but to see if there's some way they could trap Jesus and bring some charge against him in order to get him removed from the scene. You need to examine your heart and make sure you come to worship for the right reason. They didn't have the right reason. Now there's some speculation that maybe the, the man with the withered hand was there as a plant by the Pharisees. That they got him to come hoping that Jesus would, would heal him and thus work on the Sabbath and violate their rituals and be subject to being charged. There's no biblical evidence for that idea. It may best be that the man had heard that Jesus was healing people and he showed up because he was hoping that maybe Jesus would heal his useless hand. But whatever the situation, you, you have Jesus addressing the Pharisees and he becomes angry. There are not too many times in the Gospels where you find Jesus angry, but he's angry here. And if you look at it carefully, you see that he's angry with people because of their hardness of heart. Sometimes we get plastered and socked and drilled and hurt by the circumstances of life. And we begin to be cynical and we can become hard-hearted but we need to take a strong look at that because Jesus doesn't like that. If you give out a hard heart, don't be proud of it. Be ashamed of it. And ask God to tenderize your heart so that you can please him by the attitude which you have. These Pharisees made Jesus angry because of their hardness of heart. And then after Jesus had 
caused the man's hand to be made whole, healed his hand. There's such a sad ending to this little drama. They went out and joined with their enemies, really the Herodians, to plot a way to kill Jesus. Some people that worship, this man was there to experience the transformation that Jesus could give him. Jesus was there to show his love for people who were hurting. And the Pharisees were there wanting to kill the best man who ever walked the earth. Now, if you're in a Bible study, you could say, well, this is one of those examples where Jesus is confronting the rituals of the day, which the Pharisees were so, uh, which they cherished so much. They weren't satisfied with 10 commandments. They created 600 more. And um, some of them were just absolutely insane. For example, you couldn't work on the Sabbath and working was carrying anything that had weight. And they decided that anything that weighed more than two dried figs was too heavy and thus would be work on the Sabbath. And they had another rule that if you cut your finger, you couldn't put ointment on it on the Sabbath. You'd have, you could put a, a rag around it, but you couldn't put ointment on it until the next day. And Jesus was constantly confronting the people who loved ritual more than they cared about people. Rituals can be helpful. Traditions can be helpful. But they are not to be worshipped. We must never forget and allow our rituals to cause us to forget the need to love one another and to care about people more than our traditions and rituals. But I, I, I want today not to do a Bible study on this and and to talk about those angles, but to just look at this man, man with a withered hand. I think we can all identify with him. I know I can. He was in the back of the room. Jesus was here. The Pharisees were sitting over there to evaluate and judge. I can see that man back there. Hesitant, not sure he should have come. Pretty sure that Jesus wouldn't pay any attention to him if he didn't walk forward. I've spent a lot of my life like that. Not sure about what to do. Not sure that I ought to step up. Maybe some of you have felt like that too. We can identify with him. But Jesus disturbs his reticence by saying, stand up. It'd be interesting if I were to say to the last person on the view back there, stand up. You'd probably run down the steps instead of taking the elevator. <laughs> he stood up. He probably thought about running. He's scared. What's going to happen now? Why did I come today? I should have stayed home. But he stood up, and when Jesus said, come down here, he, he walked down front. It's, it's amazing, really, when you think about it. When people are in trouble, Jesus shows up. That's what the gospel's all about. People in trouble, Jesus shows up. And we can identify with that because over and over in our lives, we've been in trouble and Jesus has shown up. And he's made all the difference in the world for us. So we can identify with that man in that regard. And then we can identify with the way Jesus transforms life. Here was a man who walked into the room with a useless hand. He walked out with his hand healed. Can you imagine the difference in his attitude? Can you imagine how he felt about now having a useless hand useful again. How much he must have loved and admired Jesus for helping him. And we can all identify with what a 
What a wonderful thing it is to see how Jesus transforms people from weakness and failure into people who are responsible and able to do things for the kingdom of God. I want you to think with me about your hands. Uh, if you would, just look at your hands. Think about how precious hands are. Uh, the significance of hands. Now, none of us here suppose that Almighty God has hands like this, but we love to express our faith by speaking of God's hand. In the Old and the New Testaments, there are phrases like, they were blessed because God's hand was upon them. And you know, sometimes you've experienced that, haven't you? Where what you were trying to do was blessed because God's hand was upon you and upon what you were trying to do. And the Bible has the word hand in it over 1,600 times. Sometimes God's hand, sometimes the hand of other people. And of course, the story of Jesus comes to a conclusion on the cross with him saying, into thy hands I commit my life. Our songs have wonderful use of the word hand, God's hand. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know, we've, we've, we've sung that for years, haven't we, as children, as young people, amen, as uh, crazy adults. Got the whole world in his hands. Or one of the songs that I love, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me home. Let me stand. I, that's a good, a good song. I, I love that song that uh, maybe, maybe some of you are familiar with it. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. When you sing that, you just it, watch out. Next time you sing it, you'll have goosebumps all over your back. Hold me with thy powerful hand. And then who cannot? Oh, my. I just feel like having a, stopping the singing and having a prayer meeting when we're singing, Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. You know, sometimes Methodists go to a meeting where some of the Pentecostals lift their hands. Hey, you know, that's fun. Won't you do that? Here, lift your hand. You, you, nobody's going to call you a Pentecostal for doing it. You can lift your hands and say, thank you, Lord. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Praise his name. Praise his name. And when you think about hands that uh, are useless, I've met two people who didn't have hands. They were born without hands. And meeting one person like that, will make you mighty glad you've got hands. Sometimes hands can become useless. I had a friend in Opelika. I heard that she'd played the piano, but she hadn't played in a long time. And we needed somebody to play the piano on Sunday night. And I said to Jackie Samford, Jackie, would you play the piano for us on Sunday night? She said, preacher, I have played in 40 years. But I persuaded her to start back, and she brushed up on it. She had not forgotten how to do it, and those hands began to be useful for Almighty God, and she began to play the piano. Forty years not playing, then she comes back strong and using them. Maybe somebody here who's got something dormant in your life, some gift that you've got that you need to bring out of the shadows and Start using it again for the glory of God. Jackie did that. I was in a home one day in Texas and noticed a painting by, beside the doors. So I was going out and I stopped and looked at it and admired it and said to the, the, the wife, uh, uh, who was our host, 
I said, that's a beautiful painting. Who did that? She said, I did it. I said, do you have others? She said, no, I've never done but one. I hope she didn't see the sadness in my face because I was thinking, you should have done some more. Don't stop with one when you've got a gift like that. Use it, use it, use it. And you think about how hands can be useful. Think about how God can use consecrated hands. You know, when Matt and I were ordained as elders in the Methodist church, and every preacher who's been an elder in the Methodist church has knelt down on the floor somewhere and the bishop laid his hands on him. You know, the church has this tradition of laying on of hands and um, the bishop put his hands on Matt's head, on my head. And he said, kind of interesting, some of the language in our rituals. The bishop said, take thou authority to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. I'm thinking, preacher, you ain't going to have any authority unless the people give you some. You ain't going to take it. So you might as well hope and pray that they'll give you some. And I thank you for giving Matt some authority because he doesn't have any unless you give it to him and then work with him to use it for God's glory. But consecration. The word consecration in Hebrew means to fill the hands. To fill the hands. It, it really means you have nothing to offer God until he fills your hands with something to give him. So consecrate. Fill my hands that I might serve you with what you give me to serve you with. Think about your hands. You can slap somebody in the face. I can think, I can see four people here. I wish somebody would go slap them in the face and wake them up. <laughs> don't do that, please, please don't do that. If that were to get back to Matt, he'd, he'd never let me preach again. <laughs> I've never been slapped in the face. And I thank God that though I made a bunch of mistakes raising my boys, I never slapped them in the face. So you can use your hand to, to do bad things. But you can also use it to bless people. Sometimes I say to Dean, kind of kidding her, honey, if you love me, you'll rub my forehead. And she'll sometimes do it. And it feels so good to have a loving hand on your forehead. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You just don't want to blush or laugh and let me know that you do. I don't understand that. That's all right. But you know, growing up, a child never learns how to walk until somebody has held his hand. And then after a little bit, he gets enough confidence to take a step or two on his own. So the hand is important. I remember when I was a teenager and dating Dean. I wanted to hold her hand, but I was scared. I was scared she wouldn't like it. I was scared she'd turn me down. I saw older boys like Grady Rowell holding the hands of his girlfriends, you know, but <laughs> I, I was not sure I could do it. And uh, sometimes uh, I'd take Dean, we'd walk across the bridge and go to the Fane Theater and see Gene Alter, Roy Rogers, and uh, going back across the bridge, I'd think, I'm gonna hold her hand. And I remember the first time I tried it, I was scared, but I reached out and took her hand and she didn't pull it away. One of the greatest moments in my life, really. <laughs> I was accepted, it made, made such a difference in my life. And I, you know, I really didn't care that much about the, the movies, the picture shows we called them back then. I, I was there mainly to be in the dark and sit close to Dean. <laughs> and um, I, I remember wanting to put my arm up around her, like the, like the big boys were doing, you know. And uh, I finally got the nerve up to do that. 
But I, I put my hand back on the back of the seat, you know. I didn't want to touch him. I was afraid she might jump. So I finally one day I laid my hand down on her shoulder. And blessing of all blessings, she accepted it. <laughs> and you know, I imagine looking at this crowd, many of you have held the hand of someone who is dying. I, I have a feeling that nobody ought to have to die alone. If it's possible, you and I need to be there. Hold somebody's hand. I remember one day holding the hand of a man in Opelika. I was in the hospital. He was dying. No family there. He would drunk his way out of his marriage. His wife didn't care for him. His children didn't like him. Nobody was there. I sat there for four hours. The sun went down. And as the sun disappeared, his breathing stopped. And I was just holding his hand and telling him I loved him. Everybody needs something like that, don't you think? Your hand or my hand, somebody's hand that can be a loving gift at a time when life is ending. Well, I, I want you today to realize something. You've been listening to Walter, but Jesus is in this room. And Jesus is speaking to you. Just like he spoke to that man in that synagogue a long time ago. He heard Jesus. You can hear him speaking to you about your hands, about your life. And the challenge is always to yield to him. To yield is, is a significant word in the Christian experience. Until you're willing to yield to Jesus, you will never have a life worth living. We, most of us are Methodists. You know, every Christmas we pull out John Wesley's prayer and part of it says, Lord, I heartily and freely yield all things to thy pleasure. It's important to do that. Have you, have you done that? If you haven't yielded to him, then singing these songs ain't going to help you a whole lot. But you yield to him and then sing the songs and the songs just have much more meaning to you. Worship has more meaning to you. Everything has more meaning to you. Yielding to him. Some of you read uh, My Utmost Far as Highest by Oswald Chambers. I'm going to give you a quote from Oswald Chambers that's worth taking home. He says, yielding to Jesus will break every form of slavery in any human life. I believe that with all my heart. Yielding to Jesus will break any form of slavery in any human life. So if you haven't yielded to him, do that today. You yield to him by saying, oh, Father, I yield my life to you. You do it by getting up the man in the back had to stand up. He had to walk down front. There's something for you to do. A few years back, uh, a man who was a nurse came to St. James where I was preaching. And um, we, we became friends. I would not known too many men who were nurses, but He'd spent his whole life as a nurse in the military, and then after he got out uh, nursing, and uh, he was semi-retired when he came to church out there, and I got to know him. His name was John Walters. You remember Nathan Hamilton? Nathan who worked for Lazy Boy. Nathan who was such a beautiful witness for Jesus. Nathan had a brain tumor, suffered for 13 months and finally died. During the time he, he was suffering, his arms and legs and back and shoulders would hurt. 
I was visiting with, with him and Liz one day, and Liz said, you know, John Walters comes out three or four times a week and brings some kind of ointment and, and rubs it on Nathan, and it sure does help him. And I thought to myself, we don't have a committee at church that arranges for people to go take ointment and rub it on people. If we had one, the committee would spend the first three months trying to decide which ointment to buy. <laughs> and then they'd spend the next three months complaining because the finance committee wouldn't give them the money they needed to buy what they wanted. <laughs> and they'd spend the next three months trying to talk some of you into going to take the ointment because they were too busy to do it themselves. I guess what I'm saying is you can't wait for a committee to show you how to live the Christian life. There are times when you've got to listen to Jesus and get up and walk forward and begin to serve instead of sit. John Walters did that. And I admired him for doing it. You remember Helen Keller? In her story, this is such a wonderful line. She said, listen to, these, listen to these words, how she put them together. She said, I was struggling like a ship lost at sea when someone took my hand and showed me all things and more than that, loved me. Ann Sullivan had consecrated hands. Helen Keller's life was changed because consecrated hands took her hand in theirs. Just have an idea that if you look at those hands and you say, Jesus, fill these hands, consecrate these hands. They're yours. Take them. Show me how to use them that I might be a blessing while I live this life. Your life will be blessed and others will be blessed because your hands are consecrated and yielded to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. In these moments, Lord, speak to every heart here. Show us what we need to do next in order to become the person you want us to be. In order that our hands might be a blessing to those around us. And Lord, help us to just do simple things with love to honor Jesus and serve him so that through the use of our hands, people can be blessed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.